TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells, because this is, um, this, this is, this is YouTube. <laughs> I forgot my intro. That's tough. I'm gonna edit that out, man. Um, What's this behind me, man? This is the lit one live, man. This is if you miss any lives from YouTube or you miss any lives from Twitch, they go on here. Well, uh, we do got the Patreon. Ooh, definitely forgot to record for this for tomorrow, but <coughs> what time is? <coughs> it's like one a.m. right now, but you know, let's see if I can get it done. Uh, and we got the Discord. Uh, the links to all three of these are down in the description, man. Uh, let's get into the video, though, because it's a long one. Uh, this is HMP Frankfurt. Franklin, sorry. If I'm not mistaken, it's Monster Mansion? I don't... I, that's what the... That's it's a very severe, secure environment. HMP Franklin. Everything's just... Keys. There's nowhere to go apart from the jungle that you are in you'll be banged up with some of the most sadistic criminals in britain people who are just pure evil oh what is going on come on buffer or walk the corridors with a triple killer he is a manipulative sly unfeeling monster you might even come face to face with a man who has murdered children because of huntley's fame and notoriety other prisoners were jealous of that as an inmate in here i don't know about that i, I can't say it, that type of behavior somebody that that emmed kids other prisoners were jealous of him because of his fame and notoriety i don't think jealousy is the word they want you'll need to watch your back you were literally in extreme dying group being sure come on start into moment be a lot marketing in so it's a lot of I'd say I would not have cared the lot of people is some Franklin in the beautiful countryside of County Durham lies a high security prison HMP Franklin. So this is Franklin Prison where I was when I was uh, 21 year old. This is where you come down in the wagon and you go in through the big gates into reception. Don't know if it's still got it as you go in. It's got engraved welcome. He sounds like Leslie from Benidorm. No offense. That's just... That's how I... Um figure out who people, where people are from because I can, because of the shows I'll be watching. To hell. Built in 1983, Franklin's been expanded three times and now its sprawling wings house 840 prisoners. Pretty big. For your view on a typical cell, is just a big, big metal fence. There's no greenery or anything inside. Everything's just grey dark and miserable nobody has ever escaped from real prison type shit <laughs> Franklin is category A the highest security rating if you went over that wall there would be a big gap in between and then you've got the big metal fences and then you've got the barbed wire I think that's how every prison here in America is you got the wall, you got a, like a mold in between, or for y'all it's like a concrete, then another big metal gate with barbed wire. Yeah, if you get over the you. fence, then you've got the wall, which is never going to happen. It's all fences and gates. It takes a while to get from the main gate the to, the, to the top wings where, where I worked. Franklin's newer wings are built in a distinctive L shape allowing guards to keep a better eye on the prisoners because there's two spurs on the wing and like they've got their office in the middle there's a big metal gate so you can lock it so you can't get onto the other spur 
On each spur of the wing arose a 40 to 60 single occupancy cells. Prisoners are locked inside these at night and at certain times each day. This is not a joke. This is a very severe, secure environment. It's closed in. There's nowhere to go apart from the jungle that you are in, surrounded by mostly a bunch of killers. of prisons this is what i'm thinking of you know what i'm saying not that <laughs> not in finland somewhere where they rehabilitating you for 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 real life <laughs> my bad i like like for real though like a prison for me it should look like a prison what you do inside the prison though okay cool you know what I'm saying? We can rehabilitate. We can offer everything that you should be offering to get people back on their feet. But as far as aesthetically, man, let the prisons look like prisons, man, instead of hotels. Like that, man. Behind the high walls here are some of Britain's most notorious. As long as you're not violating nobody's basic human rights. Notorious criminals. Some of the people that are inside of here, I mean, like you've had the likes of Yorkshire Ripper was in here. He's just died recently from here. He had COVID. Got Ian Huntley. You've got the worst of the worst behind their walls. Um, some really sick, horrible men in there. Delroy Grant, the night stalker rapist. Levi Belfield, killer of Millie Dowler. Hold on, I'm gonna the write night this down now. Now y'all got me bent. I'm looking for good documentaries. You feel me? And they just wheeling them off right now. Hold on, where's my notes? Cause y'all be thinking I don't be really, you know, putting effort in, but I do, low key. <laughs> Go back all the way. Who was this Ian Huntley? Ian? There's um, some really sick, horrible men in there. Delroy Grant, the night stalker rapist. Levi Belfield, killer of Millie Dowler. Yeah. Levi Belfield. Only man in Britain to have two whole life terms. Michael Adebelajo, the killer of Lee Rigby. It's home to Wayne Cousins, the killer, police killer. Who? This one's a, who? Of Lee Rigby. It's home to Wayne Cousins. You said Wayne? Hold on, one more. Adebelajo, the killer of Lee Rigby. It's home to Wayne Cousins, the killer, police killer of Sarah Everard. People who you just know it's uh, just pure evil if they've been notorious in the, what you deem as notorious in the last 20 years then i would have met them murder robbery violence drug dealing fraudsters uh, burglars aggravated burglars robbers murderers gangland figures you know you say the wrong thing to the wrong person on the wrong day you could end up with a pencil stuck in your eye or you know a six inch nail stabbed into your throat I don't think anyone was prepared mentally for the difficulties they might confront dealing with so many highly dangerous men. This is giving me real uh, Florida penitentiary type feel. Man, shout out to the first responders, man. Can we get 100 likes on this video? First day, please. That's how I'd appreciate that, gangy, please. <laughs> I say if I ask nicely, shoot, get a better response out y'all. If you've got a serious enough sentence to be sent to Franklin, your first day will be beginning with a rude awakening. Door open. Bang. Right. I mean, you're on the move. Huh? On the move? Well, you're going on a long trip now. You're then locked into a Category A van. If you're high risk or exceptional, you'll have police outriders or you'll have a helicopter which will follow you all the way to your next prison. The sweat box is like that. It's in a little cubicle. Your only clue on where you're going is trying to get a glance at road signs and where you're heading. Handcuffed from the van to the reception area. Well, first thing on arrival, you just think like, 
do the fuck with these, you know what I mean? Like, they'll be strip searched to make sure that they've brought no contraband from the previous jail. Totally high security. Seeing the screws standing all over with the dogs, got the uh, guard dogs and that. Everyone's out on the wings, like looking at you to see who's coming, the fresh people coming in on the wing. People will be curious about who you are. They will be particularly curious about what you're in prison for. You'll be given a bed pack for your bed, a towel and all that. You get your vape or your own vape. And you're banged up behind the door. As you come through the door, put your hope aside, mate, because anything you're hoping for is not going to bleed and happen. Real time but prison, before you get settled, there's something you should know about Franklin's screws. They just can't help themselves. And it's in their culture. I still had to fight in them. So they, they was on it as much as we was, so it was going off quite frequently. So Frank No offense, I what the, why does this keep coming up? No offense, I've seen some prisons documentaries with like literal gang stop employees that worked as um guards, um as the cashiers, um, you know what I'm saying? Like, that type old principals from high schools. They have some real guards in Franklin, huh? Yo, on my mommy. You've only out. just arrived at HMP Franklin, a Category A prison in County Durham. And already, other prisoners will be warning you about some of the screws here. When I worked at Franklin, there was quite a lot of ex-military there. There was ex-pit ex, uh, workers. This group of local hard guys are some of the most feared POs in the prison system. They thought, we want something tough and north in the prison system. He, he, he looked like, like he ready to give you a miserable time. Anytime somebody got a haircut and they fade not blended on the side, you know they're a menace. They thought, we want something tough and northern, so we'll put it in Durham. Uh, when I was in the 90s, a lot of them were ex-army. And uh, they, they used to tear up, they liked to tear up. They still had to fight in them. So they, they was on it as much as we was, so it was going off quite frequently. I've experienced it and I've seen and they deal with people sometimes. They just can't help themselves. And it's in their culture. Franklin employs over 700 people, including prison officers, and not all of them have the same attitude to the job. The staff in there who put on the uniform and, and feel like they have to be this aggressive, kind of say, I'm in charge because I'm wearing this uniform. And, and, and that makes your life really hard. If you're a firm but fair prison officer who, who understand the environment you work in, it could make your life difficult. Prison regimes in the north and the attitude of prison. Sound like... Sound like, uh, the police, the regular police. I believe there's good in everybody's, you know, good in every job. There's good people in every job, but there's also the people that make it tough for everybody else. And officers in the north was far more reactionary and anti-prisoner than it was in the South. It's got a reputation for being run by what people call the Geordie Mafia, being big on steroids, big on violence. They don't like Southerners. If you're a prisoner of colour arriving at Franklin Prison in the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, former inmates claim that there were rumours that would make you especially nervous. So Franklin itself has the reputation of those staff up there being worse than the rest by way of not liking anything else but the colour of white. If you were a London prisoner arriving in Franklin, the hostility you faced from staff was quite bad anyway. But if you were black and from London, then you were literally in extreme danger of being seriously assaulted. Franklin gets that reputation for, for being a racist jail just because we don't have a lot of diversity among staff, but that's just the region we work in. I can't sit and say that there isn't a problem with racism in the prison service. 
I suppose that ignorance goes in all walks of life. But what I can say is from 2006 to 2010, I never witnessed that at Franklin. You never witnessed it? Did you never witnessed it or you didn't choose to witness it? Or you looked the other way? It's two different... Recent report on Franklin didn't make any direct reference to racism. The chief inspector of prison said the promotion of equality and diversity needed improvement and required greater prioritization. Nah, you, <laughs> that's clear cut, my boy. That might as well said this, that, this to me might as well said, yeah, it's a little bit of racism in here. We trying though, <laughs> you know? And it's not just the screws who are allegedly hostile. You've got the local criminals to worry about too. So the young guys wasn't used to interacting with a lot of black people. You get into arguments with them and all that, they're quick to bring colour into it or something stupid because they never really know no better. They're all kind of shaved heads, bodybuilders. There is a type of Franklin prisoner. I would not be telling the truth if I didn't say that Franklin is to some extent and always has been since it was envisaged a powder cake. New prisoner Ricky quickly discovered being from the northeast was an a powder keg. Like I've always heard that term used, but I never ever knew what it meant exactly. I could go look it up, but I'd rather one of y'all just tell me, man, for the interaction of it all. So like when the way he used it. Franklin has always, and since the beginning of time, been a powder keg. What is this? Advantage. These were the most powerful groups of Franklin. Obviously, you've got the Markhams, which is the Sunderland lads. And you've got the Geordies, who's from Newcastle. Yeah, and you had a, quite a few Middlesbrough lads. Durham boy Ricky grew up with Franklin on his doorstep. On my way down the, um, coming down that road there, Driving through the gates, I had a bit of a, like an excitement about us, like just waiting to see what actually is behind them walls, you know? I was like, I wasn't scared. I was like looking forward to being in there, to be honest. You was insane. You weren't scared. I wasn't scared. I was insane. You was looking forward to this? In 2007, two local guys around the same age found themselves arriving at Franklin. One was a prisoner, the other was a screw. Ricky and Craig both grew up in County Durham in the 90s, hanging out in similar places and attending similar schools. But they were going to end up on very different sides in Franklin. Was they homies I'd no? previously been in the military before I joined the prison service. So for me, it was a natural progression going from one uniform job into another uniform job. People were quite surprised when I said I wanted to go there because of what they heard about the players. Ricky had slashed a man with a machete. He was sent to Franklin for GBH with intent. The mindset that I was in, I was in a sick way enjoying it. <laughs> Craig had family inspiration for joining Franklin's screws. My dad had been in the prison service for 30 years. Me mum was in the prison service. My sister was in the prison service. And Ricky had a... Bro came from a long line of prison guards. <laughs> like, I ain't never heard that, honestly. Family history that set him on the path to being banged up here. Me dad had spent a lot of years in jail. We, um, before I was born, he'd spent about 14 years in prison. And uh, he used to tell me prison stories and stuff when I was a kid. And from you couldn't wait to go. That's what it sounds like, it's coming next. From a young age, 78 year old, like, I always wanted to go to prison. <laughs> this is crazy. I never really had any role models, right, good role models growing up. Always looked up to gangsters and stuff like that, and obviously getting in there and being surrounded by them, I was like, loving it really. Like I've heard like before, like I, I always looked at the gangsters, I ain't had no real role models. But like going to prison to meet them is like crazy. You ain't want to do what they was doing on the free, in the free world. Obviously you was on some, 
some debauchery stuff, but... When his cell door slammed behind him, the young Ricky was in a strange frame of mind for a man who had just lost his freedom. See, on the first night so, there, um, when I was in my pad by my cell, I was looking out at the window, and I had my music on, because obviously the lads could give us a hi-fi and that. And then when I was listening to some sort of uh, dance music, and I was just, like, looking out onto the yard, looking up at the metal fence and that, and I was just, like, bopping away to the music and just thinking, I've made it. (laughs) 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 Ah, Hey, this is one of the best people I've ever seen in a documentary. He got to he got to Frank he got to Franklin HMP hey he got to Frank he got to HMP Franklin and said I made it I'm finally I did it I did it we made it I'm here now look at me now there was some elements in the prison service that That's reflected true. the army because there was a lot of ex military still in the prison service at that time so it was it was nice still having that sort of regimental aspect of it. Just take pride in your uniform, make sure you're presentable, everything run on a time in the prison service just like it did in the military. So yeah, it was it was it was a nice continuity. But while Ricky was excited to arrive in Franklin, this prison was about to wipe the smile off his face. So the second year that I was in Franklin, they, um I went in the kitchen with me one of my pals. He said he was going to cook as a steak. That was a bit of a welcome meal. Prisoners in Franklin can buy ingredients and cook their own meals if they want to avoid prison slop. We're seasoning up the steak, and there was a couple of lads in the kitchen. Um, and one of them was starting washing his dishes. Well, I was looking over, and I just seen this pan of hot oil bubbling away. And like, I looked, and I thought, I wonder what's going on there, because it just seemed a bit out of place, a big pan of hot oil bubbling away. Um, and some lad came in, picked it up, tipped it over the back of his head. Burnt him bad. It burnt him bad. You know what, it's not a nice sight, you know. It's the worstest thing you can do to someone. It was only his second day in Franklin, and new prisoner Ricky had already witnessed an inmate being attacked with boiling oil. This inmate turned out to be one of the jail's most notorious residents. Prisoners that got their hot oil tipped on him was um, Darren Barrett. And he was the head of Al Qaeda in the UK. Oh. Well, I mean, I want to say. <laughs> Darren Barrett is a. Darren Barrett? You see? I'm getting all of the. <laughs> high-profile terrorist, thought to be senior in Al-Qaeda. He plotted to slaughter thousands of civilians in the UK and US, and details of his narrowly thwarted plans horrified the public. He traveled to the United States and started picking targets, major targets for terrorist attacks. Um, The World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, New York Stock Exchange, Citigroup. And he was planning to use dirty bombs to destroy each of these targets. He also simultaneously was planning an attack on the London Underground, which he was going to flood, hoping to kill many thousands of people. Caught and found guilty in 2006, Barrett was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 40 years. Barrett is sent to Franklin, after his conviction, has put in the a minimum term of 40 years. Like, can we get life without parole? Like, is there not, not, not a such thing as life without parole in the UK? Among the ordinary prison population, he was an extremely dangerous man, softly spoken, surprisingly intelligent, and utterly deadly. If you're guilty of terrorist offences, the authorities need Category A security to keep you under lock and key, making this prison an ideal choice. One of the things that Franklin has got is a lot of terrorists. 
at least 25 at any one time. In March 2022, there were 159 terrorists in prison classed as Islamist extremists and 57 categorized as extreme right wing. Many of the most infamous and deadly are housed at Franklin. The prison is home to Michael Adebalajo, the killer of Lee Rigby, with a machete in the car. Hashim Abedi, who helped to plan the Manchester Arena bombing in 2017. Franklin also includes the murder of Joe. What? What? They, they, they dropping. Manchester Arena bombing in 2017. Frank. Majesty. Hold on. What? What was it? Who helped to plan the Manchester Arena bombing? Bombing. In twenty seventeen, Franklin also includes the murder of Joe Cox. The MP, Thomas Mayer. Craig remembers dealing with notorious terrorists as part of his job at Franklin. When they started coming in, in 2005, 6, 7, 8, the, they were kind of well-known individual terrorists or terrorists who you'd, who you'd heard of for weeks and months on the news and then they were stood in front of you. Um, so it, it was quite an interesting time. And if any of the names they seen are standing out to y'all, which I know they are, like say them in the comments, and you should do a reaction. Find something on this person. Find something on that person that he mentioned. Seeing how the prisoners were going to deal with that. Franklin is a microcosm of society, and society in Britain changed. In a, as a result of the 7-7 bombings in 2005. If anyone now doubted what we were seeing was a coordinated series of terror attacks, confirmation came just 10 minutes later. A number 10 bus passing through Tavistock Square was torn apart by a bomb placed near the back on the upper deck. It was full of people recently evacuated from Russell Square tube station. We became more suspicious, more frightened, Yes, we'd had terrorists before, but not like this, not in quite the same way. Uh, Frank, honestly, I haven't heard of none of these things that he's talking about. Like that 7-7 bombing, it, none of these. I think I heard of Ian Huntley, but I ain't really heard of none of the names. Clint, in the mid to late 2000s, attitudes towards prisoners in for terrorism were becoming increasingly hostile. Yeah, don't, they people, have, don't they normally have their own wing? Obviously don't like what they're in for, so they, then they do become a target. The attack on Barrett rocked the jail. New prisoner Ricky could sense that things were about to escalate. And about two weeks after, another terrorist that was left on the wing by himself. Obviously he was probably feeling vulnerable, thinking that he was going to get attacked. So uh, he's walked up to one of the Geordie lads that was just sitting there eating his tea and went up behind him and just went like that and tipped the pan over his head. But this went over his full head, all down his face. And his head just blew up like a watermelon. And this fresh attack wasn't to be the last of the so-called juggins at Franklin. Scalding someone with whirling her. It just seemed to be popular among these prisoners to throw hot oil over themselves. Um, it, it kind of became the go-to assault. Originally, you know, in the old days, it was made for sex offenders. For somebody to do, well, to do it has to be serious or it has to be a hit. Prison officer Craig got used to dealing with scalded prisoners who had skin flaking off from attacks with boiling oil or water. There was one prisoner that I saw it. It was actually worse than what I, what I previously thought. We just put him in a cold shower and his back, his chest, his face, his head was all was all really badly burned. I think that, that might have been actually the last incident. I think then after, after that, they did, they did start planning oil in the prisons. But the chain of... <laughs> after the first incident, I mean, after the first incident, it should have stopped. 
events set off by the attack on Dirin Barrow were only just getting started. Terrible thing to do to what I believe as a peaceful man, as I know him, to be honest. Who are you, you know, talking about? If you're going to harm somebody that a lot of people are close to, people are going to get the ump. Most of Franklin's Muslim population have nothing to do with terrorism. 99% of Muslims in prison are not in on terrorism charges. But seeing fellow Muslims being attacked by white prisoners sparked a conflict over race and religion. So when Muslims get attacked, you know there's going to be a, there's going to be a comeback for it. It's as simple as that. The atmosphere on the wing when you walk in. Man, there got to be some type of mitigating circumstances, though. Like, I get it. Like, in these type of prisons, you got to roll with who you roll with and keep that like that for protection purposes, but come on now. Look what bro was plotting. <laughs> and, and that sounds strange, but you, you can, some days you can walk on the wing and it, it's, you can just feel it, you can feel that tension. And it did come to a point where the whole wing went up. Everyone was fighting each other, it was like the Muslim lads against the white lads. And it went off like big style. With it being an L-shaped wing on F-wing, obviously we were on this side of the wing whilst it was happening on the other side. Um, and everyone started running towards the gates, but the screws locked the gates so nobody could get through. And obviously you could just hear all the commotion, the alarms were going off, the screws were running on the wing. It was just going off for about half an hour. And I was glad I was round this side out of the way. <laughs> the screws eventually regained control of the wing but the tensions and conflict sparked by the attack on Barrow were lasting. So then it develops. It becomes us versus them. The non-believers and the believers. And... and one of the most loathed men in Franklin chooses a side in this conflict, perhaps hoping for protection. He's got no respect in the system whatsoever. And to make it even worse, he's a big lump of a geezer, which makes him more of a target for people. In Frank... In Franklin Prison in the 2000s, there were growing tensions over race and religion, and prisoners were picking sides. Yami was a prisoner who was serving 12 years for robbery with an imitation firearm. Mm. This sentence saw him being juggled between different category A prisons, including stints at Franklin. He found himself inspired by the Muslim community. He got 12 years for an imitation firearm. Is that the same sentence? It would have been it was with a real one, right? Or brotherhood he met inside. But one of the most loved men in the prison system was about to enter the fray. A lot of the Muslim Brotherhood, who I got on quite well with, were coming in slowly and then quickly into the KA system. And I converted. Some of the brothers that I met, I took a shine to. And, you know, some of the brothers were passing me material, hadiths and stuff like that. 16% of Franklin's population and Muslim, and a growing number of these are converts like Yami. He found the appeal of Islam was that it offered a spiritual structure for tackling some of his issues. I had addiction problems at that time. I thought the routine and the way that it's designed Islam, as well as loving Allah, of course, I thought, well, I'll convert there, take it really seriously and see if if that can cure me. And it was probably my best nine months in the case of clean time, to be honest. So it, it did help me. For other converts, there may be more cynical motivations for finding Islam. When Levi Belfield was sent to Franklin in 2011, almost immediately, he uh, became a Muslim. Inside Franklin, Belfield goes by the name Youssef Rahim. Belfield is responsible for three murders and one attempted murder. 
the murder of Amélie de Lagrange, the attempted murder of Kate Sheedy, the murder of Marsha Bernoulli, and the murder of Millie Dowler. Belfield is one of the very few men in Franklin and in the prison system as a whole to be serving a whole life sentence. He'd already been given this when he was linked to the murder of Millie Dowler. Coward crimes, so I call them. Most crimes cowards, because you're taking advantage of a vulnerability of a people like Belfield, because you know that you can't lose that. He is a manipulative, sly, unfeeling monster. And if you've ever had the pleasure or displeasure of being within a foot of him, you'd know exactly what I meant. He's 20 stone, his neck size is 19 and a half inches, and he's six foot one. He got on his ass, didn't he? He said he twist on, he let big as hell. What was that? My charger not here? Play them type of games, huh? I don't know what that is. He's very intimidating, especially when you see his temper. Yami and Levi's paths crossed in a number of Category A prisons, and Yami formed an instant view on Belfield. A fearful looking man. I hated him, I hated his guts on sight. I was in the presence of real evil. So why would a violent and unrepentant man want to convert to a religion that preaches peace? Normal criminals who haven't the faith of Islam will no way Jose will be ex accepting him and inviting him around for a cup of tea to their cells. Levi Belfield wanted to convert to Islam just to be feel wanted and be part of the Muslim gang, so to speak. He becomes one of them, and then he's then got protection from them. And Belfield is certainly in need of protection. Other prisoners are disgusted by him. He's got no respect in the system whatsoever. And to make it even worse, he's a big lump of a geezer, which makes him more of a target for people because a lot of guys want to do someone like him, but they don't want to do some weak, sniveling geezer. Oh, so they were trying to get start stripes off. As a convert, him. Belfield now had to be taken to and from the mosque for services, which meant ordinary prisoners like Yami could get close to one of the most loved men in the prison system. He said a couple of goodbyes to a couple of brothers, and then I made my move. As I was going past, he turned his head that way, looked at me, and the screws were standing there, like waiting for him to stop holding court and get back to where we're going. So as he turned around, faced me, I head butted him on the bridge of his nose and blood started pouring out of his nose. His face went purple. He never got no, no chance of retaliation. Uh, and I carried on moving away um, back to my wing. <laughs> Whatever they might privately feel about Did he just say he did a drive-by headbutt? That's what I just heard. That's how I just... Let me hear it one more time. That's how I just decoded that. He did a drive-by headbutt. And I carried on moving. Purple. He never got no... Started pouring out of his nose. His face went purple. He never got no, no chance of retaliation. Uh, and I carried on moving away. That's exactly what I thought. Whatever they might privately head, feel about it, at HMP Franklin, screws are responsible for the welfare of some of the most notorious and hated men in Britain. The child killer, Ian Huntley, was transferred to Franklin in 2008 and instantly made a name for himself as a tricky prisoner. With Huntley, sometimes he got... He got this thing where he was famous he kind of had this attitude and he liked to push boundaries sometimes po's are encouraged to treat volatile huntley with kid gloves but craig went in with a firm approach but i kind of set my stall out with him straight away i think he's when i went in there he i said huntley i'm your staff for the day and he was like i'll be referred to as mr huntley 
and I was like, no, no, it's Huntley, and you'll call me Mr. Wilde. And that was, that was the end of it. Ian Huntley is serving a minimum of 40 years for two brutal killings which mortified Britain. On Sunday afternoon, in August 2002, two schoolgirls, Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, left a bar... I did, I did do this. I did a documentary on this, did I? With you to go to the local shop in Soham to buy sweets. Yeah, I did They never returned. On this. And at about quarter to nine that evening, they were reported missing. Within hours of their disappearance, police from no, three forces and hundreds of townsfolk have joined the hunt for Holly and Jessica. Soccer star David Beckham appeals for them to come home, but by Wednesday, August the 7th, Police fear they're dealing with a criminal abduction. I love him so much. I just want him to know. <laughs> just I don't love anyone who's got children must know what we're going through. <laughs> Huntley invited Jessica and Holly into the house, supposedly to see Maxine, who they knew from school. It was a lie from the beginning. Ian Huntley pretended to help with the search for the missing girls positioning himself as a concerned local resident. People have felt in the dark and felt like um, we can't do anything to assist the police. We all want to do something, but nobody quite knows what. And one of the most chilling moments of television I can remember is when uh, Huntley was interviewed outside the house by a Sky News reporter who said, you must have been the last person to see them alive. And he says, calmly as you can imagine, Yes, I probably was. How did they seem to you? They seemed fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. I didn't see anything untoward, nobody were hanging around. You know, they just seemed like normal, happy kids. Safe and well? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you may, as it turned out, have been the last person to actually chat to them before they vanished. Yeah, that's what it seems like. I think because they were, it was such a poignant picture of the two girls wearing their Manchester United shirts, and uh, which were incidentally found in Huntley's residence, that it shocked a whole generation of parents. Were they, was it safe to let their girls walk to the village shop in a Cambridgeshire village? Nah, I didn't see this one. I, I got to watch that one. That's deep. Well, the answer was no. He was arrested, in fact, on the day that their bodies, their decomposed bodies, were found in a ditch near RAF Lakenheath. After pretending to help search for the missing girls for 13 days, Ian Huntley was unmasked as their killer. And at his trial in 2003, he was handed two life sentences. Prison officer Craig quickly discovered how much delight this brutal killer took in his notoriety. The crimes have been on, on national TV and it's been spoke about amongst everybody. Yeah, I think I, Huntley did certainly enjoy that side of things, yeah, definitely. Because of Huntley's fame and notoriety, prison, other prisoners were, were jealous of that. And the, the, as soon as he came on the wing, they would have attacked him immediately. His crimes made him a target for other prisoners. So Franklin's staff had to come up with a plan to keep him safe in a prison full of killers. There would have been a queue for a people to get to Huntley if they could have done. For his own safety, he was kept away from that. He was kept in, in segregation, and he was kept in the hospital, Huntley. And um, that's where he's, he spent the majority of his time. But no place in Franklin is ever going to be entirely safe for Ian Huntley. The men in here have made a habit of violence, and they're primed to take an opportunity. I was just young at the time, and I was in that mindset where I just didn't give a fuck about anything. I was still having them violent thoughts, and I felt violent. Mindset where I ain't gonna lie to you, this is my favorite person. <laughs> I ain't know it. This is one of my favorite people that I ever seen on a documentary like this. This dude is just wild minded. He's a wild minded individual. I just didn't give a fuck about anything. I was still having them violent thoughts and I felt violent. And to Ricky, someone like Huntley was the perfect target. Ricky's chance to get at Ian Huntley came when he and some mates visited the hospital wing for their appointments. So as we got down there, we actually seen him on the other side of the door. He was waiting, he was about 20 foot away, waiting to go through 
on the other side to go back to his wing. But we, um, the Scrooge opened the door and there was four of us just went legging it towards Huntley. We just missed him by seconds. We well, mean the rest of the lads were going to stamp all over him if we got a hold of him. A narrow escape for the Soham killer. Unsurprisingly, other Franklin prisoners have got their hands on him. And he's been attacked repeatedly um, with uh, improvised weapons, razor blade in a toothbrush, uh, water, hot boiling water. Not surprising. Damien Folks, an armed robber, for example, attacked Huntley uh, in 2010 and slit his throat with an improvised weapon. It wasn't the first time Huntley had been attacked, nor will it be the last. Huntley's he just survived and everything. Hated, isolated, and will spend the best part of his life in prison. He's made a number of suicide attempts, and it's the responsibility of Franklin Screws to stop him succeeding. He threatened to kill himself, so he, he'd be put on on a um, on like a suicide watch. And but Huntley was on a constant, so he he had a member of staff basically sit there and watch him for 12 hours through the day. And you had another member of staff who would come on the night and just sit and watch him sleep for 12 hours on the night. Yeah, me 12 hours. Easy money for security for y'all, all right? Was went slowly. While some may consider Huntley to be among the worst of the worst, prison officers have to put their personal feelings aside, like Craig did, and accept that part of their job is looking after prisoners like him. It would be hard going in there and dealing in them situations and dealing with them prisoners knowing that the crimes they've committed against children. But you've, you've just got to be professional. You've just got to do your job. Screws at Franklin may deal with notorious killers every day, but they can't afford to get complacent. There's always a chance that a murderer will strike again. My arm just gave way and the, the, I, I saw the, the blood that started to come out and I realised that he, he severed my artery. Yeah, see, this is one of them jobs I'd never, ever, ever even think about doing. I had a friend that I went to high school with. She, um... Uh, she was a prison, um, she was one of these people. I don't know how she did it or what level of security it was, but I know she was a, she was a correctional officer. And I look at her, I'm like, you are a correctional officer? Like, I know you, I noticed if something went, got to, I, if something kicked off, you would not be, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, suitable. At HMP Franklin in 2010, there was a bloody clash between a prisoner and the prison officers. One of the most controversial events in the prison's history. Now, we hear accounts from both sides. Kevin Thackeray was convicted, along with his elder brother, of killing three drug dealers also convicted of two attempted murders of two women who happened to be in the house. The killing... What are you trying to do, hit a lip? ...committed by the brothers were under what is known in British law as joint enterprise, um, which doesn't distinguish between which of the brothers actually pulled the trigger or stabbed the women. The judge acknowledged that his elder brother probably initiated the killing, cold-blooded... ...killing as the judge called it. Both brothers received life sentences and were sent to Category A prisons. In 2010, they ended up on the same wing at HMP Franklin, the wing that prison officer Craig Wilde was working on. We had Mikey Thackra, as he went by, arrive on the wing, and he, he, he wasn't a problem. He was quite flash in how he handled himself. He liked his design of gear, and then we had his brother arrive on the wing, um, probably about eight, nine months later. A change then. P.O. Craig says that when Thakra arrived... Hey, sometimes all it takes is a little family member to get there, but then they really become one, 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 one strong entity of debauchery. Both brothers started acting out. 
that started becoming a bit of a control problem, both of them, they kind of fed off each other. Craig says that prison officers put Kevan on the basic regime to sanction his behaviour. So he'd been put on basic and he decided to barricade himself in a cell. We thought, right, we're going to have to go and now get kitted up with Almadon and the shield and go and get him out of the cell. But So when the call came through and they said, no, just leave him. The following day, Craig was on duty and says he saw a female prison officer approaching Thakra's barricaded cell on her own. So I told her to wait. And I went down as and I got as I got close to the door, I just said, is he all right? And she went, yes, I says, right, open the door. And she opened the door and he'd come out aggressive, um, shouting, telling, like he was shouting, come on or something like that. So I've grabbed him by the... I'm, t I'm a little confused. Didn't y'all just break protocol of some sort? It had to be a protocol against that that y'all just broke. He was in there barricaded yesterday and y'all didn't have to follow no type of, you know, restrictive guidelines on, you know, six people suiting up like normal, like a normal. This is one of the toppest security prison, cat A, big dog prisons. And y'all did a mistake like this? That sounds mistake-like. Um, shouting, telling, like he was shouting, come on or something like that. So I've grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and I've started to push him back into a cell. Um, you grabbed a grown man by the scruff of the neck? But I didn't realize that he had a he had a broken glass bottle tied to his hand and he's come and he's stabbed us with it and it's getting us underneath the arm in the armpit and my arm just gave way and the, the, I, I saw the, the blood that started to come out and I realized that he, he severed my artery. I was running back along the wing. Two members of staff yeah. came in and... Under that armpit is a deadly spot, man. I took it in turns, just pressing and sitting across my chest and pressing down on the wound to try and stop the bleeding. And I started to get more tired and I just thought, yeah, maybe maybe this is it now. You know, I was I was going to bleed out there, there and then in this... in this room in the middle of a... in the middle of a prison. I'd lost a, approximately eight pints of blood by the time I got to... to University Hospital. In HMP Franklin, a violent prisoner had come close to killing staff. In a call from inside, Kevin Thakra tells us what he claims triggered the incident. You know, being Asian and Muslim in Franklin is... Uh... I mean, the, the racism there from both sides, the employees and the, the prisoners, it, it's been the case for decades. Things escalated, Thakra claims, when his brother Mikey was sent to the segregation unit. Thakra alleges that in the seg, Mikey and other prisoners of colour were attacked by the screws. They were going to go doing some racist attacks. And I had a visit booked. He had one booked as well. It was a joint visit with our family. I think the day after or two days after he had been assaulted. And he had a boot print on his face from where they had stamped on him. And he told us what had happened, um, not only to him, but to other people. Thakra alleges he reported these attacks to his MP and to the police. And the prison responded by downgrading his prison privileges. I was going to remain on basic for the rest of my time in that prison. And yeah, nah. I feel like in Franklin, at least the way they putting it, like if you got jumped by employees, you just had to, you had to take that. You couldn't even tell. They're going to downgrade your stuff. You're going to be sitting in there. No TV, no, no bed sheets. And if I didn't want to do it on the wing, I can do it in the seg and get the same beatings that my brother was getting. Uh, this was, all said with abusive language, um, racial language. They attacked me on the landing and threw me in the cell and locked the door. I'd heard them talking about assaulting me, so I threw the cupboard in front of the door and barricaded it so they couldn't get in. These were the events that Thakra claims led up to the attack. I ain't gonna lie to you at this point. I, can't, I believe him. You feel me? I feel like... 
everything is caused by every every action is caused by a react every reaction is caused by an action caused by an action like I don't know for some reason I just feel be I believe him <laughs> Craig disputes Thackra's version of events Kevin was on basic because of his attitude and his behavior it had nothing to do with the color of his skin or his religious background there's no truth whatsoever in what Kevin that was saying about the incident and that it occurred because he was being racially abused or it was self-defense because he was worried what staff were going to do. Thacker was charged with the attempted murder of Craig and the female officer. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with this part. I just want to make that clear, YouTube. I'm saying I kind of believe the reason why he... Uh, I'm saying I believe the reason why he barricaded himself into the in the, in the room at that point. And with wounding with intent, a third PO. What followed was one of the biggest trials in Franklin's history, engulfing the prison. Prisoners and prison guards took the stand as witnesses for each side. Fakra argued that the attack was a preemptive strike and he acted in self-defense as he believed he was going to be attacked by officers. In court, new details emerged about Fakra's frame of mind leading up to the attack. His friend Paul remembers the case. A prison psychiatrist who actually initially uh, was there for the prosecution basically jumped sides and said that Kevin suffered with a post-traumatic stress disorder, so when he self-ended his cell, that triggered in. That is why he fought back. Thakra's PTSD was diagnosed when he arrived at Franklin, but it stemmed from being attacked by prison guards in a different prison. In court... Uh, PTSD was PTSD, PTSD, PTSD is normally company, accompanied by paranoia. It go one in the same kind of, in most cases, so. That kind of makes sense. That, that, it does make sense. Or oh, the jury must have accepted that in that state, he genuinely believed force was needed to defend himself and he was cleared of all charges. See what I'm saying? I wasn't wrong when I said, I feel like I believe him. He said, I don't believe him. It just came off as super believable. And I said, I don't know why I believe him. But see, PTSD it make you think that you really need to go to those measures. See, and I was right for believing him, somewhat technically. The jury concluded or agreed that he was probably suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and didn't therefore increase his sentence. It was a serious blow for Craig and the other injured officers. He could have killed me that day and killed another three prisoners or members of staff or anyone and he just would not have cared. He would have still found a At the same time, like I feel like some type of chain of some like something was not done right on the guards part. Like y'all knew how volatile he was feeling at the moment. Y'all knew he had PTSD. Y'all knew he had barricaded himself into that room the day before. Like, I'm not saying it's this guy's specifically his fault because the female prisoner, like, so all of these things happen that were out of his control, basically. But I still think y'all should have, like, more guards should have went. Y'all should have been suited up. Y'all should have, just, just in case, you know? It's Cat A, it's, Frank, it's Franklin Prison. <laughs> A way to make it like it wasn't his fault. It's fascinating, is it not, that uh, at the trial for these attacks on the warders at Franklin, the jury unanimously found Thakra innocent. Oh, unanimous! That that PTSD, uh, that's a strong, that's a strong piece of evidence. I'm telling you, he's diagnosed. He's not just saying I have PTSD. The diagnosis of PTSD, which is normally accompanied by paranoia. In that type of situation, 
with the history of why he got PTSD. Like, if I was a juror, I would have been like, oh, nah, man. Me, I would have agreed. I would have said, nah, y'all. You know? And although it was a question of, of the charge, the Prison Officers Association tried to instigate a private prosecution which failed. Consequences of what happened that day are lasting. Craig didn't regain the use of his arm and hand. He had no choice but to retire from the prison service. Nerve damage. Uh... And I'm not saying that's not unfor unfortunate for this man. He lost the, he lost his career that he wanted since you know a long line of guards. That is unfortunate. But I'm saying some something. And it's not his fault. Just something was missed. <laughs> Y'all get what I'm saying when I'm saying something was missed? Like, I be watching these documentaries so much that I feel like in that, in the, if, in that situation, they would normally come in with six, seven guards and full riot gear, even if it's the next day, just because it was a volatile situation where he we barricaded himself just to make sure they would come in there with the gear, put them up against the wall, blah, 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 do all the, you know what I'm saying? Protect themselves, go in a group. And that just, for some reason, didn't happen in the world's most toughest prison. Like, I don't know. Chronic pain, uh, the, the, the main nerves was all severed in my arm. Had to have nerves and tendons taken out of, out of my legs and uh, Ended off with a lot of muscle wastage, which won't come back. That's all scar tissue now. Uh, the deformity of my hand. That the did try to make my hand kind of sit in a normal position, but it's just... It's clawed and... and d wasted. So that'll never come back. That, that stuff, post-traumatic stress, severe depression. Uh, it, it, it just had a massive knock-on effect. And it, it, it's had a knock-on effect with relationships, relationships with my children. While Fakra may have been cleared by the jury, there would be consequences on his return to prison. Some people would call it inhumane. Some people might even say it was torture. What on earth else can we do with someone who's prepared to attack prison officers with a broken bottle? Put him in the psychiatric ward. Right? Or people with PTSD don't get put in psychiatric wards. Do they know, right? But something else gotta happen. Like, we should have known retaliation was coming. Kevin Thakra, a prisoner at Franklin, who has stabbed officers with a broken bottle, was found not guilty of all charges in court but the prison establishment still had to deal with Thakra. So they then decided to keep him in solitary confinement. Thakra was referred to the Close Supervision Center, or CSC system, which holds some of the most dangerous men in prison in very restrictive conditions. And close supervision is exactly what it says on the tin. A very close watch is kept on each individual prisoner. The CSC program of Kevin Fackler has been put on is designed to weaken you and, you know, take the fight out of you, yeah, and you don't have contact with no one else. They feed you through the door. We'll have, like, five officers to unlock with shields and helmets on. It's, it I know a lot of y'all is looking for Benordum, too, but... <gasps> It's another, like, the next episode is in parts, and it's missing two parts. Um, and then after this episode, like, there's no more until at season eight. So the whole of season six and seven is not on YouTube. So it's like, what are we doing? What, are, what should I do? You know what I'm saying? Intimidate you, and it's just a very draining existence, and I've not seen anyone go through that system and come out the same. Throughout the prison system, there are about 60 men in close supervision centers. 
being treated in the same way as Kevan Thakra. And a lot of the guys, when they first come on the CSC, if they're not already mentally ill, they become mentally ill. And within a matter of months or years, end up in hospital from suffering the conditions of life in the CSC. A 2015 well. report found that there were a disproportionately high number of Muslim, black and minority ethnic prisoners in the CSC system. While prisoners can be deselected from the CSC, few actually are. An argument rages about whether detaining prisoners like this for years is justifiable. Prisoners deserve to be in a prison within a prison. They deserve to be in a CSC system, definitely. And a lot of members of the public, they won't understand that. They'll, they'll think, well, no, he's, he's been a product of this, or staff must have done this. There's a reason he's like this. But some people are just evil people. And it's, it's as simple as that. That's true. In 2021, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, Nils Melzer, visited Thakra and saw how he was living. When used for more than 15 consecutive days, these conditions of detention amount to torture, was Melzer's verdict. Thakra has been kept in these conditions for over a decade. Damn. In response, the Ministry of Justice said, we strongly disagree with this depiction of close supervision centers, which are only used when a prisoner poses a significant risk of harm to others. Some people okay. would call it inhumane. I would say that a lot of people would say, what on earth else can we do with someone who's prepared to attack prison officers with a broken bottle? Where did, where did he get a glass bottle? Like, where did he get a bottle that was... Like, because they say broken bottles, they make it sound like it was glass. Where did he get a glass bottle from? And in a high, in a high security prison. When they're in a Cat A prison. has long been used as a tool for punishment at Franklin. Paul was sent here in the 1980s and didn't even see the communal wings. When I first went there, I went into the segregation unit, which was quite crowded, quite over four. And that was because staff had a straightforward strategy or policy in relation to prison who they considered to be difficult. They were placed straight into segregation. And it was a way that staff were able to maintain what they believe is a total control of the prison. Paul had a tendency to rebel against the screws, organizing protests and advocating for prisoners' rights. It's why Franklin sent him straight to the segregation unit and ultimately it cost him dearly. I was originally sentenced to life imprisonment with the judge's recommendation that I must serve no less than 25 years. I eventually spent over 40 years in prison because of what was defined or called my oppositional defiance disorder, or otherwise my propensity to cause trouble. But life for Paul wasn't defeated by Franklin shoving him in the seg. Although he was trapped in a single cell for 23 hours a day, he made use of his cell's tiny window. Ow. Quite amazing to arrive in the SEG unit at Franklin, which as I say was quite overcrowded at the time by what staff would consider the most subversive and manageable prisoners. We established almost a community just by conversing and talking out of windows, you know, we would have question and answer sessions, quizzes out of the window, uh, sing songs. Yeah, but then you're down the SEG, he used to like pass the time, we used to have like quiz master. One of the boys would make up a load of questions. Uh, sports, I said, well, I was good at, uh, I'm dumb. Uh, yeah, all sorts of some stuff I didn't even understand the questions. <laughs> to be honest, yeah. There's some very educated people in prison, I just ain't one of them. I think I used to sing Irish rebel songs, so <laughs> my heritage being Irish. An amazing, incredible community of prisoners. And it was a, a mood of defiance and solidarity there. So yeah, I, albeit I was only there for 28 days, I found it quite an inspiring experience, actually, yeah. But 
that even with mates behind bars, loneliness is part of what grinds you down at Franklin. Obviously, when you're coming out, talking with your friends on the wing and all that, at the end of the day, you're always going back behind your door by yourself. And you're just stuck with your own thoughts, stuck by yourself, thinking about the outside world. So it is a rare, it is a lonely place, prison. Women on the outside become a major obsession for Franklin's prisoners. Many Cat A prisoners are only entitled to three or four visits a month. And the UK doesn't allow conjugal visits. Mm. Nonetheless, some prisoners manage to hang on to relationships from before prison, like Gary. I think if you allow conjugal visits, violence might go down or something. Something, there gotta be some study or something. Who was serving a life sentence. And if I get this off real quick, <laughs> conjugally, through a visit, then I might come to the back to the myself with a lot less stress, a lot less build up. You know what I'm saying? And uh, one of my partners come up, and they put us in a room with not a lot of people. When I didn't see the camera, so we was in a room, right, fucked off with just us, and fell a long while. And they said I had sex on a visit. While some single Franklin prisoners benefit from a strange phenomenon. Women who want to meet and date serious criminals. There is a kind of a, a, a black market in um, in sort of relationships, if you like. And when I say relationships, I mean it's sort a whole TV show on Peacock about <laughs> sort of nah. not deep relationships. You have casual relationships with a geezer who's give you a bird who lives round his way, who likes who likes to look at you because she you sent one of your photos to her. You know, that's that's the kind of relationships. Peripheral and, and, and sad, really. Like sometimes you might have a friend who's a prisoner, who's got a, f a girlfriend and his girlfriend's got a friend and you start writing her and talking to her on the phone and the next minute she's visiting you. That happened to me a few times. Leroy's letter writing romance developed and soon he found himself receiving a visit at Christmas time, a busy period in Franklin's category A visitor suite. What's this thing called? Snow globe, right? That's right. Like it was overbooked good. and it was full and my visit came so they gave me an illegal cubicle. Yeah, and the man, the, the staff the man left me in there. Yeah, he did. And and yeah, she, yeah, she gave me still. <laughs> and he saw, he saw it from an angle. He did see a little bit. But after we was walking back to the wing, he, he was like, he was making a joke of me saying that one of the other staff was telling him to stop me, yeah, but he said, he said he's not stopping me, he said he's not, he's not holding that over me, you understand? So there was a man with a little bit of humanity. <laughs> nah, no cap. He was like, nah, I'm gonna let him go crazy. I'm gonna let him get it off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He talking about stop him. Look, this can be, this can make our life a little bit easier. <laughs> It's not just those on normal location who have the right to form relationships. Any Franklin prisoner, even those on whole life sentences, can receive letters and welcome visitors. Women who write in because they're, they're attracted to the men, they've seen them on, on the telly and they'll write in and... A lot of violent men get fan letters from women. Um, in fact, there's actually a term for it, it's called hybristophilia. These are women who are aroused by violent or offensive acts. Other women who seek out prisoners have said they have different motivations, including, ironically, feeling safe knowing that they can control the contact in a relationship and their partner can't hurt them because every day is in a high security environment. You get women when you go down visits who have met them through kind of prisoner dating sites. Um, and they'll come in and, and sit and meet them and, and things like that. It, it is, it, it, it is. Prison, prison tender? What, what's going on? Quite surreal, knowing that the crime's at the ring for, and these women are still like, well, yes, I want to be with you. Women gonna always love bad boys, man. Good guys never finish first. Y'all know the sayings. This is quite literally. In May 2022, reports came out that one of Franklin's most notorious prisoners had a new woman in his life. Well, Belfield had all sorts of reasons to uh, 
get back into the public eye. At one point, he confessed, quotes, to the Chittenden killings of Lynn and Megan Russell. He didn't kill Lynn and Megan Russell, not his handwriting at all. He also bragged that he was going to get married. Belfield met his fiancée through letter writing, and UK law says he can apply for a marriage license. He was given two whole life terms, which means that he will never be released. Right. But because prisoners are qu can be quite manipulative, very manipulative. So whether he's, he's what conversation he's having with this woman, um, what he's telling this woman, but she's certainly not getting in a normal relationship. Only the governor can put a stop to Levi Belfield's nuptials. He can refuse to let the wedding happen within Franklin's walls. I don't think Belfield else. should be allowed to marry. I don't think he's ever demonstrated one second of empathy for another human being. Only thing he cared about was his dog. Personally, I don't think he deserves any human rights. I've talked to the relatives of his victims. Where are their human rights? It will horrify the population, the prison population and the population at large. Clearly, this is an extreme view. But Franklin provokes a dramatic reaction in many who pass through its doors. I didn't think I deserved that sentence. Because that sentence was just brought out for dangerous predators. It has an incredibly damaging and devastating effect on this state of mind. And many commit suicide. At the age of 21, Ricky was sent to Franklin for GBH with intent. He'd slashed a man with a machete. His victim survived with a nasty injury and Ricky was given a daunting sentence. The sentence I got was the um, IPP and on paper it is 99 year sentence. They used to have your sentence on outside of your door and on my door it had like 99 years. 99 years for GBH? Hold on, GBH with intent? Grievous bodily harm with intent to what? To harm? Because if it was an attempted M, it would be an attempted M, not a, with intent. What does intent mean? With intent to do what? Like to harm? Like he planned it out, is that what that means? IPPs. The wording is a little bit different than the charges that be in, in America. Sentences of imprisonment for public protection came in in 2005. Oh, they were immediately protection. controversial as IPPs sent supposedly lesser criminals to prison on terms similar to murderers with no fixed release date. When I got that sentence, it didn't really sink in at first. You won't be released until the parole board think that you're no longer a risk to the public. Dang. There was quite a few people serving IPPs in Franklin because they were classed as lifers. They were just sending them all to the high security prison. IPP prisoners like Ricky were given a so-called tariff, a minimum term. Ricky's was four years, but he knew he might serve years or even decades longer. That's not still a thing, is it? IPP, that's not still a thing. You got to go, it sounds like the minimum, for an IPP, the minimum, the minimum requirement should just be the end of it. Is what it sounds like. If for, for Without an IPP, that charge would have been four years. But with the IPP, you have to serve a minimum of four years and whenever we feel like you are not a not a threat to society anymore, we're gonna let you go. But see, a lot of that is gonna be super biased because he's in jail with a record. Like, how do you determine that? He in jail getting bigger, lifting weights, getting more jail tattoos, looking more and more intimidating. Like. I don't know. That's I didn't weird. feel like I was a risk. I didn't feel like I was a risk to the public. So uh, I didn't think I deserved that sentence. Because that sentence was just brought out for dangerous predators. And they ended up giving it to too many people. The idea when it was created was that it's going to help. We're only going to use it on about 900 people. 
10 times that were actually given. IPPs were intended to protect the public from violent criminals, but they were given out to people who stole mobile phones, got involved in punch-ups, or jacked bikes. I know lots of people what? in there with small tariffs. They were supposed to do a small sentence, and they've been in there 10 years over. Yo, you sending people... <laughs> that might be exaggerated, I don't know. You sending people to H&B Franklin with IPPs for stealing bikes? Some more than 10 years over. And they just... Imagine stealing a bicycle and getting a minimum of eight years, a minimum of, of, of six months, but having to serve 10 years. Oh, man. Sitting there, I'd be wasting sick. away. It demoralizes them, makes them have no hope, no future. It sets your anxiety off and it makes you depressed not knowing when you're ever going to be released. And you can't tell your family back home. Your family's saying, like, when are you coming home? Or, and you can't tell them because you're stuck in there without a release date. So I have to contemplate and recognize that I may never, ever, ever be released from prison. There's an incredibly damaging and devastating effect, uh, effect on this state of mind and many commit suicide. Tragically, 71 IPP prisoners have killed themselves. That's around twice the rate of suicide for other prisoners. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's unfortunate, but like, they're in, they're locked up with lifers. Crazy type sentence, like, they're locked up with lifers. They're locked up with prisoners who've committed real dangerous crimes, who are real threats, and they stole a bike. <laughs> like, no, that don't even, it don't even fit. <laughs> It is something that we used to talk about amongst each other and say, like, not that we were going to do it, but wonder what going through people's head just before they do it and what, what way they would do it. Ricky didn't get out when his four-year tariff elapsed. The parole board turned him down. Yeah, when I got to Franklin, obviously I still had my girlfriend and she stuck by us. I did say to her at one point, um, just go and do your own thing, like don't stand wait up. around for me because I could. That's a stand up dude. That's a real one right there. Be in for I always say that, man. If you if you locked up for more than a year, like, man, you might as well just charge it to the game. Your girl going to be out there doing them dirty anyway. So, so just let her. <laughs> X amount of years, I never know. But then a year later, Ricky was one of the lucky IPP prisoners to convince the parole board he was safe to release. My girlfriend was waiting for us at the gates. And all I was thinking about was going to McDonald's to get a Big Mac. And uh, I went to McDonald's, got a Big Mac, and I was disappointed in the size of it. It was tiny. <laughs> Had to get two of them. Judges stopped handing out these oppressive sentences. Y'all got Burger King in the UK? A Whopper is, a double Whopper is way more, a double Whopper is way bigger than a, a Big Mac. Just saying. As in 2012. Good. But if you were already serving an IPP, you were trapped. Today, so 1,722 IPP prisoners are still behind bars. David Blunkett, who was Home Secretary at the time, uh, the introduction of IPPs, has subsequently called it a stain on our history and his worst mistake. I think he was right. Yeah. It's a very, very blunt weapon and didn't work. And it's left trauma in its wake. Yeah, Since they need to take that away. And they need to review all the cases with IPPs and determine a non-biased group needs to review all the cases and let them go, man. His release, Ricky is connected with the families of some of these prisoners and has become acutely aware of how lucky he was to actually find a way out. Oh, that, my son's been in jail for 12 years and it's all for still, Mike. Yo. I was just joking when I said that. Like, I heard them say it. But I, I thought they was being over-exaggerating it. So I just took it and my son's 
been in jail for 12 years. And the IPPs have been abolished for now 10 years, but yet everybody still kept on them. And there's some lads in prison being in for like 17 years for, for robbing a bike when they were 17 year old. It's just outrageous. Someone needs to be done with that sentence. That's ridiculous. But a decade later, things spiralled for Ricky. He was charged with aggravated vehicle taking and the terms of his IPP sentence meant he was going back behind bars. Ricky was sent to none other than Franklin. And it was nothing like his first excited arrival at these gates. This time, normal? the difference was I didn't want to go to prison. So when I got recalled, like, my head was just in bits, not knowing when I was going to be released. And he, um, my kids, well, the youngest two was only two and three at the time. And they kept saying, Dad, when are you coming home? And I couldn't tell them. And that, for me, was the, the worst part. It's always kids. Kids always do it. I told you. In 2020, Ricky found himself locked up in the UK's official lockdown, meaning he barely left his single occupancy cell. And um, we got locked down in the COVID as well. So I didn't have any contact, didn't see my children for eight months. Um, so that was a really hard time. Back behind bars, Ricky's mental health deteriorated. I was suffering with anxiety again. Like it was unbearable, the feelings I was having. And I put in to see the doctors and it took 10 weeks before I seen anybody. And they, um, some of the people that I've seen in prison had just had big slice marks all up their arms and been cut in the faces because they weren't getting any help, they weren't getting the medication that they needed. And they were just locked behind the doors nearly 23 hours a day, self-arming them, just with no help. As of a 2020 report, Franklin had worrying levels of self-harm amongst his prisoners, higher than other cat A's. The place that had once seemed exciting to Ricky now seemed tragic. He was desperate to get out again. I'd been in for 13 months. Um, I'd done another course whilst I was in, and I just kept my head down. Um, got on with the time, and I got out after 13 months. Now he's back at home with his family. Ricky avoids thinking about his... They got a beautiful family too. Hey, I couldn't even, man, listen. Long history with Franklin. It's been 17... That's why, listen, I'm on, I live in Miami. Spring break is happening, or was happening last week, still happening this week, kind of. I am not participating. First of all, I'm too old for that. Second of all, like, I know me, and I know drunk people. Like, I, I'm not going to die, bro. <laughs> in years, I wouldn't even put don't look back and focus on negative things because it just brings you back. So I just focus on the here and now and focus on the future and positive things. But Rick is still under probation. If he makes a wrong step, he could find himself back in Franklin's holding cell, reading the words, welcome to hell, all over again. It's just a horrible existence being behind them walls. I'm just so glad I'm on this side of the wall now. Looks like an airport. It's a W thumbnail. That's the end, right? Of course, no accountability. TLL, leave a like, comment, subscribe. Evidence to support. Turn on the post notification bells. Hit that like button. I'm gone.